with the grand theorist, I wanted to go through the, the whole legacy. So I would say that your line would go from Comte, Durkheim, no, sorry, Comte, Spencer, Durkheim, then um, Talcott Parsons, and then you. And then I want I wanted to ask you what, how, how would you, how did you perceive the work of Talcott Parsons? What I you thought when I first, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, even as everyone was saying it's so conservative and this stuff, and, and, then, and then, then of course the sociologists do they, they paint Parsons as some kind of right winger. He was a very liberal man. He he he, he housed people during the the, 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 the wealthy old thing and and, and and gave him money. And he's a very liberal, nice guy. He was he he was a, had his own problems, but we all do. But the uh, he basically was a nice man. I think his theory, theory approach, I really began to realize was not quite the right way. But what I liked about it, and that's what I liked about Durkheim and Spencer and even Comte, is they thought big. They thought about the whole universe. And in Parsons' case and in Spencer's case, they talk about social universe in the context of the physical and biological universes. That's, I like that. that. That's interesting to me. Uh, and so, uh, I originally, uh, the, the institutions book that I originally wrote, and even the institutions books that I'm writing now, uh, it has a lot of a spot, uh, Parsons' AGIL uh, uh, model in it, or, or Parsons and Smelser from the, the models from the economy and society, but I hid it. You wouldn't know it when you read it. Well, you might know it if you, unless I tell you it, that's where it comes from. Uh, because he, when he talked about institutions and their exchange relationships they had in terms of their media, that actually became the, the basis for my analysis of institutions. And, uh, and I'm just expanding on it. So uh, while I didn't think this whole idea of creating these, these sort of static paragrams where you have a, a box in which you put something, you see, putting something in a box does not explain its dynamics. It explains maybe its relationship to something else in a kind of rough way. But you need to have a, a more dynamic model than that. But still, he was trying something that I thought was very interesting when I was in graduate school. And uh, I still find it interesting. Uh, and so uh, he still influences my work. But it's not the kind, same kind of work, because I have an entirely different view of th what theory is, the explanation is. I remember once uh, he, he was at UC Riverside, and we were walking around the campus, and uh, for some reason we got talking about Bronislaw Malinowski, because that was because he'd been at Cambridge when, when Parsons at Cambridge, and he said, "Yeah, I, I saw him, but I, I, he, I didn't impress. He wouldn't impress me very much, but I was always very impressed with those of us. But then I asked him the question: uh, Do you consider explanation to exist when you?" If you have a, a conceptual scheme of categories and you can take something and place it in that a category within that larger conceptual scheme of categories where you specified some of the relationships among the categories, is that explanation to you? And he said, yes. And see, that's not my view of explanation, but it's one way to look at explanation. And to me, it's, it's about dynamic processes. Can you can you tell me how one thing, as it, it changes, affects other things, and and, and to what way and to what degree, under under what under what conditions? That's explanation. So that call, calls for a proposition and a model to explain what's actually going on. And this affects that, and there's always almost always reverse causal effects and things. Mm -hmm. and that, that, so. Uh, that, that's the difference. And uh, so that's why, I, and it's about that time that I read Spencer. I was just and about I, to ask, what, how, what that, do you think about Parsons? I, well, I, was, I had to write, I, I, I was my student, Leonard Bagley, and then later, other, later editions with Charles, another student, Charles Powers, I had to write, we had to write, well, I, I, the publisher wanted me to write a history of sociological theory whereas the structure of sociological theory was more of a contemporary sociological theory, but although it talked about where the contemporary theories came, it didn't have elaborate discussions. And so we divided this up and I, and I said, Lenny, Weber's always bored me, you do that. And uh, since Marx is interesting, but uh, I'll let you do that. I'm not interested in that. Uh, and um, 
at least that was for the first edition. As it went along, I, I, I took over more and more of the rewriting of it um, and, uh, because they, they, they were less and less interested in actually doing it. Uh, but uh, I said, I got to read Spencer. I owned Spencer. And I was prepared to, to read the, about the person everyone said was this uh, uh, racist, uh, sexist, uh, uh, social Darwinist, and, and all the things they say about Spencer. None of those are true. They're just flat out lies. And, they, and if you ever read him, you could never say those things. Where do you think they came from, these lies? Well, because his philosophy is sort of, you'd have to say, uh, conservative right wing. Uh, but his sociology is not. Uh, it, it, it's just very powerful stuff. And so I, I read uh, The Principles of Sociology, and I'm probably one of the few people who has actually read all of it. And I've read all of it a couple times. Wow. And I, I read, then I began to read uh, some of the earlier works, the philo philosophical works, uh, such as such social statics, which even that is nothing what they say it is. It's actually quite a a liberal book. Uh, uh, and if you read the thing he says, uh, what the state owes women, you'd be, you'd, it's a feminist statement. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I mean, so, they, and so then, but when I read Principles of Ethics, which is the last big thing he wrote, I realized he just repeated a lot of the worst part of social statics and made it four, two, or two, three volumes. And that was, and he was always bitter that people evaluated him on that, but that's his own damn fault. He shouldn't have said that again. You know, he wrote it. But so I, I read I principal psychology and principal biology in there too, uh, along the way. I didn't read them when I was writing the, the sociology, but I, I, I read them. I got multiple copies of, of all those. Uh, they're part of my pride of my, my library. Uh, and um, so the, uh, I was just so shocked that uh, what what people uh, the portrayal of Spencer was so wrong and so unfair uh, in a time when people were genuflecting in the graves of Marx and Weber and Durkheim and even George Herbert Mead and, and Zimmel, and they are spitting on the grave of Herbert Spencer, who was every bit as good a theorist, probably a better theorist than all of them. Uh, but uh, what American sociologists don't know this because they got their part prejudices and they've been taught. Every time I, I read things sometimes, and it, it's just clear when I read, read a discussion of Spencer in a book, it's just a, someone's read a, a, a secondary analysis of Spencer, never read Spencer himself, and just repeats it. And that's how it's sort of like a folklore. It goes down through generations. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt it. very many sociologists ever picked up the principles of sociology and read it. If you did that, you would have a very different view of Herbert Spencer. At any rate, so I was, uh, kind of irritated by it. So not only I wrote the chapter about it, then I said, that's when I wrote the book on Spencer, uh, uh, Herbert Spencer, uh, Toward a new, Renewed Appreciation. And I tried to lay out what a great mind this was. He was he was so far ahead of his time. He's so far ahead of most contemporary sociologists who just dreaded, you know, just, you know, become uh, almost prehuman about uh, the, what they do. If you don't, you don't have, if you aren't mad at the world and doing justice, uh, you're some kind of uh, terrible human being. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sick of that. And uh, I think they're pretty terrible human beings for being so stupid and blind about everything. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to uh, the social movements involved because, of course, there's, there are these things that need to be addressed. To. But I don't think being a professional sociologist qualifies uh, you to be a particularly good activist. Uh, what you do is become a a pious person stuck in academia, uh, proselytizing students, uh, forcing them to uh, buy your ideology. You're not out there doing anything for the real people in the real world who need help. I agree totally. You're just, just living in with a tenure, with tenure in a nice middle-class house, uh, preaching to students, and you think you're really sticking it to the man. I don't think so. You're not doing anything. Yeah, a lot of it's identity stuff. Ooh, look at me. Um, so I wanted to ask you about Talcott Parsons' relationship with Herbert Spencer. I remember reading in some of your work that it seems like in the beginning, Parsons is very dismissive of Spencer, but then towards the end of Parsons' career, he actually starts to incorporate some of Spencer's work into his own. 
Well, I think that's something he doesn't realize uh, I, uh, that he was doing. And I, and I used to think, God, the guy's a plagiarist, you know, almost sometimes. But I, I think the way he works, if you look at AGIL and you look at, say, um, that's why I asked him the question about Malinowski. Look at Malinowski's four functional records, which are the same. They got a slightly different labels, but they're the same. And I think he got that. He read that. He internalized it and, you know, just sort of forgot where he got it. And I think that's what happened when he, when he started talking about the overall action system. He's reproducing Spencer because he's, Spencer wrote principle, first principles, which are the sort of principles of physics that drive the social, the social biotic and physical, uh, physical universes. Uh, principles of psychology, principles of biology, principles of social science. Then he throws in ethics, which is the telex system for Parsons in his uh, the, the sort of extended thing uh, that he's writing about at the very end of his career before he died. Uh, it's Spencer. Uh, and I think he may have gotten that idea, but he'd kind of forgotten where he got it. You know, he'd been sitting in his mind for 30 years, four years. Uh, so I don't think he was deliberately uh, aping Spencer, but he, he, so I think that's, a, that's the way his mind worked. He absorbed a lot of things Inter, they sort of got integrated and they came out and he put them in this, this scheme he had developed. Uh, but that's very Spencerian. Uh, and so uh, I don't think he uh, thought highly of either Malinowski or Spencer. Uh, Spencer was relevant for his book uh, and the, the structure of sociological theory, uh, such, 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 such structure of social action. And, um, but, uh, so I don't, it wasn't a, an effort of plagiarism. He was just uh, doing what Spencer eventually did. And uh, he's doing, and, and I'm doing the same damn thing because yeah. uh, I'm interested in biology. I'm not, I mean, I'm a social, social physicist, but I'm not doing any, anything about physics, but I'm trying to develop theories that look sort of like you might see in physics. Uh, but I, but I'm interested in biology and neurology because uh, that's what, we're, we're animals and we evolved, and that's interesting to me. Uh, and I'm not talking about the telex system and the ethical system. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the, this. We got enough people in sociology doing ethics. We don't need another person doing ethics in sociology. We need a few, few, few. We need not only a few, like like thousands less doing ethics and more doing sociology. We might go somewhere. Else.